Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Human Design Coffee Talk. We're going to have John Cole joining us today. Hey Phil. Hey. Hello. Hello. I gotta grab What's my up? water. Right yeah, do it. I forgot my water. What's up, everybody? There's John. This is essential. Es essential. Essential thirst. <laughs> Hello, I actually hello. have two drinks today. Oh, <laughs> I just finished my cacao, so. Oh, there you go. As you're hopping on, we would love to know who's joining us. You can drop any information about your design that you'd like to tell us about. We'd like to know who's on. Today we have, you probably already said, John Cole, 2-4 mm -hmm. Ego Projective Projector. Pull up his chart. John is one half of Human Design Collective. Teresa and I um, took classes through them and did a practicum. So John is some kind of a mentor to us. <clears throat> and yeah, hopefully it's not a tough act to follow. We had a lock yesterday. It was just been kind of <laughs> boom, boom, boom. We didn't plan it. A lock was like Tuesday. And it's like when manifestors are like this, you're like, yes. <laughs> We, okay. we just we said uh-huh uh-huh uh -huh. um it's doing that thing again where it's saying unable to join um is he on a computer john are you on a computer john, are you on a computer because you have to join from a phone oh there we go hello, hello. Perfect. good morning good, good morning, morning. <laughs> How are you? Good. I I heard you uh, saying that I had to follow a lock. So yes, a tough act to follow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It wasn't planned. You were you were booked first. The lock just kind of snuck in there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we didn't do that intentionally. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah thanks for coming on. Uh, Let me get parts so I can reference you still. Teresa's always looking at charts and talking to people at the same time. Mm -hmm. I like to talking reference about. it. You know, I like to know. Yeah, John, do you want to introduce yourself to people that <clears throat> don't know you? Sure. Uh, yeah, my name's John Cole. And I think uh, Brandy may have mentioned I'm a 2-4 ego projector. Live in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm in my, what is it? I guess I'm in my seventh year of human design. Um, so that's been fun. And what else? Oh, half of the Human Design Collective um, with Amy Lee. Uh, we teach classes, workshops. We each have our own personal practice. I'm an analyst uh, through IHDS and do that full time. It's been all human design all the time lately. Is that fun for you? <laughs> It is. It's a ride. It's just like, <laughs> wow. I mean, it's it's kind of, uh, it's a trip, you know? It's like to, to sit here and to kind of look at the world through um, through sessions, through through the system, through the knowledge, and then kind of be on the ride yourself in your own life. And um, yeah, it's it's that's probably the best way I can describe it. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately because it's like, I feel like when you do human design professionally, it, it is your whole life, but then it's also your, your life, <laughs> you know, it's everything that you do all of the time. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it can, you can feel very much like an outsider when you're in situations that are not human design, because then mm -hmm. it's like your social life is human design and your work and everything. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's been something for me to, think about these days contemplate yeah and i i was listening to your uh your talk with a lock yesterday and one of the things that kind of jumped out to me among many was uh he was talking about talking to people about human design without like using human design language 
-hmm. which is something I'm working on because it's so easy. You got these, you know, these keynotes, this shorthand for like just cutting right through a lot of, you know, the usual stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I kind of forget that because I spend so much time in that world that I can kind of sound like a weirdo or an alien mm -hmm. talking to like, you know, average people out, out in the world. And so, um, yeah, I kind of liked what he was saying about that. I think maybe, you know, maybe that's a good direction to head in. Yeah. 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 I, I definitely like to challenge myself with that at times. I mean, and when I first started human design, I was working in a gym. So I was telling my personal training clients about it. And I was very much having to think about ways to tell them about it without saying the words, you know, I didn't even really know the keynotes at that time. So it is kind of interesting almost to like, try to go back to that frame of mind, mm -hmm. almost as if I'm a newbie speaking to a newbie about something. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Brandy, if you deal with that because you own a brick and mortar where it's not, I mean, although it human design fits in there, it's mm -hmm. not only what you do. Yeah, it's interesting too, because so projectors, MGs, efficiency, right? It's super efficient. Human design language mm -hmm. is efficient. And so it's almost like, I'm like, hurry up, let's go, come on. You know, so when I'm, when I'm <laughs> <laughs> in this human design world, we can get to things really quickly. Yep. And so it's it's definitely I have to <laughs> practice patience with people when I'm not speaking from human design. I'm still looking at everything through the lens, but in my communication, I'm I'm trying to be more aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I still have clients it's, that it's are in almost like. Yeah. What were you saying? Wait, say that again. Oh, I was just saying, I still oh, have clients that aren't, aren't interested in it at all. So it's like, I'll, and, but huh. I, I'll know their design because maybe I got their birth information at one point and then I'm like, you know, trying to talk about the gut response. I'm like, oh, do you feel a feeling in your body? You know, and it, it, it is, it's kind of like a game. It is kind of fun, mm -hmm. actually. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I was going. What I was going to say is, uh, you know, when you have their chart, you're going to kind of filter everything through your own definition and what you kind of perceive in their definition. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't, if you don't have their birth data, or it's just, you know, that's not what's happening, then um, there's an opportunity, I think, to, to mm -hmm. just kind of feel into the experience and the energy and just mm -hmm. like, what am I getting from this person? How, you know, mm -hmm. and then you can kind of play, you know, have some fun with it as well. Like, oh, I wonder what this is. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. 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 Yeah, I feel like it's like a, a whole new threshold to look at it through that lens and it's kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. So John, do you want to let us know how you got introduced into human design and like you have a background of astrology that you started at a very young age. Do you just want to tell us about your journey with astrology mm -hmm. and human design and how that kind of wove together? <clears throat> sure. Yeah, I uh, was introduced to human design I'm sorry, I was, in, I was introduced to astrology um, probably when I was about 21, 20 or 21. And it, it was originally through my mother who was studying astrology. And so it was around the house and she would uh, kind of talk to my brother and I about it, but we really weren't interested. Um, we were, you know, we were interested in other things at the time. And, and it, to me, it was just kind of this weird thing that my mom was into. And I wasn't really that open to it until my brother went and got a reading. My mom had bought my brother a reading uh, with an astrologer in, in town and he came back and said, Hey, you, you should probably check this out. Like this, this, this is interesting. I think you need to do this. And so then I went and got a, a, an astrological reading and I kind of went in skeptical or defensive or kind of ignorant, you know, and by the end of the session uh, with this astrologer, I was like, all right, what do I, what do I need to know? Or what do I need to learn to know this? Like, do you have any books? Do you teach any classes? I need to have access to this information that, that you obviously have insights into my life that only I would kind of uh, know, or I have an experience of. And, and that kicked off a, a long study in astrology. And uh, I went through different systems over the years, studied modern astrology, traditional astrology, Uranian astrology, Indian astrology, and um, I was just always kind of looking for what worked. I was just tr going deeper into the, that framework and, you know, working with different techniques and different approaches uh, and was kind of in and out of the astrological world for, you know, about, I don't know, almost two decades. And then human design shows up around 
seven years ago, and it was an astrologer friend of mine who kind of, you know, ran my chart, sent me an email, dropped it in my lap and said, you, you need to look at this. You, you have this projector type, and that's also my type, and this, this is, makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I want to get your take on it. So it, that's how it kind of showed up. And I remember when I first saw the, the body graph, I was like, wow, what in the world is this? Like, you know, coming from an astrological background and like, wait, now we have centers, we've got these channels, the kind of, the, the, you know, a variation on the chakra system, the I Ching, which I was already kind of familiar with. Uh, but I, I was just like, how can this work? You know, what, you know, this is, this is madness, really. That was my first impression of it. But then I started reading about what it meant to be a projector and it just, it grabbed me. I was like, whoa, this is explaining so much about my life that I hadn't been able to find a, a framework for elsewhere. And it kind of put some things in per perspective for me. And uh, yeah, it just, then it just kind of kicked off. I was like, I, I got to learn more. I got to go deeper. Um, and then I, you know, got a foundation reading, started taking classes and then just went straight into, you know, the, the, further levels of training and, and it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of changed a lot. It's been a ride. Um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of the quick version of it. Yeah. And you told us a story one time in class about you were at like an astrology conference and like everybody that you sat with knew were like the only people that knew about human design. What was mm -hmm. that? Yeah. yeah that, that was, uh, I guess that was 2018. I believe in Chicago, there was the UAC, the uh, United Astrology Conference. And what's interesting about that is I was, you know, I had signed up for that conference and I, I had been going to astrological conferences and have a lot of friends in that community. And, but I'd been getting into human design like more and more intensely um, going into it. And I remember going out to Facebook and this was, I guess, you know, before everything had completely blown up on Facebook with all these human design groups. So it was, it was out there, but it's kind of exploded since then. But I ended up seeing that Jonah Dempsey, hi Jonah, if you're, you're listening, um, was posting that he was going to that conference in one of the human design groups. And I was like, okay, I need to, I want to connect up with this guy and see what's, you know, see what's up. I, I want to meet other people who are interested in astrology and human design. And so I ended up hanging out with Jonah the whole time and we were running around and um, kind of hit it off and um, had, had a lot of fun, you know, we're hanging out with astrologers and then kind of in a, in a somewhat subversive heretical way as, as Jonah does um, was he was out there like just planting all these human design seeds at the conference and um, just kind of a bit of a disruptor or something. But that, yeah, I think that's, that's probably what we talked about. Yeah. I love it. And the two, four and the five, one are always the buddies, right? Yeah, <laughs> Harmonics. They are. Yeah. And I'm surrounded by them. Uh, Amy's, Amy's yeah, five too. one. And, you know, it's just like I, the, some of the closest people in my life are five ones. And yeah, it's just funny how that works. You know, it, it's just that the harmony, I guess. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention too, if anybody that's watching, if you have any um, questions, you can drop them in the Q&A box and then we can kind of go through them as we go. Um, but John, right now, so you've done analyst training, living your design, like you're trained to teach all the foundation classes. You're currently doing training to teach, living your design guide training, and you're also in DDP. I, yes. So I, w I went through the analyst program, then I did the DDP program. I'm, I'm one of those people that just like kept going and just didn't stop. Um, You're I wanted, a projector. Yeah, I, I was a projector <laughs> yeah. who wanted all the information as I was kind of living it, experimenting it, work, working it out. And, uh, and yeah, went as far as I could and went through the DDP. Um, my thesis is pending. So I've completed that. That was a two year program, but I'm still working my thesis. And uh, I've been co teaching or teaching with Amy, the foundation courses, which you guys know, and we're currently doing our LYD guide teacher training with the lock, which has been a lot of fun. And so, yeah, we're kind of balancing classes, these workshops and uh, a pretty, pretty constant uh, personal practice of doing sessions and working with people one-on-one. -on -one really have your your will behind it huh you're definitely an energy, <laughs> energy <laughs> yeah. It, 
Yeah, well, until it runs out, right? You know, right. It's, like, <laughs> yeah. it's like this punch, and then it's like, okay, a collapse, punch, collapse. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and I have to say, like, I had the weirdest night last night. I, I don't know if you guys or anyone else out there is feeling this stuff, what's going on. It's hard for me to kind of separate, is this mine? Is this some, this is the collective? Is there something energetic going on? But uh, most of the house, you know, house was up last night. I think I probably slept like maybe three, four hours, you know, and um, the normal things that I would do, like the breathing or counting exercises or reading or what that that will help me get back to sleep weren't working. And I felt like I was like plugged into a light socket last mm -hmm. night. And um, so, yeah, I'm kind of on a different planet right now. So hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were talking about the the ego center last night because I was like, we were in a text message chat with Brayton and he was voice noting. And I was like, I don't even have the will to listen right now. I'll come back to this. And Teresa goes, ego off. And I was like, that's exactly what it is. But then I was mm -hmm. awake. So last night was really weird. I was like awake. And then when I woke up this morning, I didn't even, I slept six hours, which normally I'm like eight to nine. And then it was like, I'm awake. It was this very interesting energy overnight. So Yeah. Yeah, I was I was looking at the the just now chart earlier and you know the 20 24 is active with Uranus and then you got the 43 23. It was a lot of head stuff. Like I was just watching my mind and just kind of like all right, well this stuff's coming up, but it did have that kind of that 24 feel of just kind of looping on things or coming <laughs> back and yes. kind of this weird frequency. Um yeah, it was it was it was very odd. And I, I talked to a couple other people this morning and they were like, yeah, I didn't really sleep very well last night. So yeah. I don't know. But. Yeah. So what was your biggest um, point of interest or excitement or takeaway from DDP? I really I wanted to get into the substructure. I was very interested primarily in uh, PHS uh, and determination and that area of things, a diet, you know, uh, health, the body. I had come from um, a lot of my own, I guess my own personal journey, kind of uh, healing, working with the body, um, kind of before I met human design, I had, I had a lot of health issues coming up, basically, you know, exhaustion, typical projector stuff but also digestive issues and other weird stuff. And I, I started thinking that I had some sort of, um, some sort of condition, some sort of illness, you know, it's like, all right, well, something's going on here. I need to get to the bottom of it. Start seeing doctors, specialists, running blood work and, uh, you know, going all this testing and trying different diets. Like I probably did like six different diets, elimination diets and, and different versions of things. And, it, it helped a little bit, but I felt like, you know, that basically there was something deeper that I wasn't really getting to. And it was human design when it came in really seven years ago that started kind of opening that up for me and, and saying, well, f first issue is you're, you're not really operating as a projector. You're not living as a projector. You're not honoring your design. And then you, you get a lot of stuff coming up, you know, that you're out of balance, out of alignment. And so the DDP for me was, um, kind of a means of going deeper in that for my own exploration, my own experiment, but also because I saw how valuable it could be for other people. And I wanted to, to include that in the work I do. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, yeah, that was mostly, and then I got into the, the psychology side with motivation transference. And that was really interesting. That's been really helpful as well to kind of see that play out. So, yeah, but most, it was mostly kind of the body side of things. Wow. Did you notice like, because I know you were working full time and like running yourself into the ground before being a super generator. Mm -hmm. Was there like a breaking point for you or like, I can no longer do this anymore? Yeah, it was my Uranus opposition, but ah. it took some time. <laughs> it was my, yeah. ur my Uranus opposition rolled around and I'd been working at a software company for eight years. And uh, I pretty much knew early on, like that when I walked in there that, this wasn't quite the right place for me, but I, I had a, a baby on the way and I was and needed insurance. It was all the mundane practical stuff. And I was like, I, I've got to get this job. And then I stayed in the job, which was really kind of interesting because I get to look back and see a lot of the open 
self-centered, not self themes mm -hmm. that kind of kept me in that position for probably longer than I, I would have otherwise if I um, maybe, yeah, was more in touch with, with design and what actually would work for me. And so I kind of had to go through this period of, of um, kind of just breakdown and exhaustion, just trying to keep up working like a super generator. Um, and I was propping myself up with like, I, I had a good Chinese herbalist doctor that I was seeing who would kind of keep me going and, um, you know, caffeine and, you know, just whatever I could to kind of get through the day and do what everyone else was doing. And then my Uranus opposition hit and there's, there's a longer story around that, but I basically realized I had to get out of there. Like that, that job that I was in for eight years, like I'm done, like no way. And I ended up leaping into a startup, a tech startup from there which was like going from the pan into the fire and ended up working. <laughs> I went from working about 40, maybe 40 hours a week to about 60 hours a week. And I'm like, Oh no, this is the wrong move, the wrong direction. I lasted four months there. So I quit two jobs basically over a period of about four or five months and, uh, and then just collapsed. And I was just, I ended up going out on my own to, to do web development and consulting on my own at the time, which was what I was doing professionally. And I could barely do it. I could barely keep up. I ended up being on the couch for like six months at just like deep exhaustion. Like when you finally stop and you reset and you can actually feel into, you know, the, the real state of your energy, your body, your, your, your well-being. And uh, that was probably the, that was the low point. That was like the bottom. And it came right around the time of the Uranus opposition. And then um, a little bit later, you know, human design entered in. I wish I would have had it earlier, you know, would have made a, made a difference you know but you know i think it shows up when it does and and then it started it basically told me like you're, there's nothing actually wrong with you you don't have some weird illness some <laughs> disease or some something like that you're just not honoring your design you're not living you know in a way that you're designed for as a projector and and so then there's a slow process of kind of like you know climbing out of that big hole that i dug for myself mm. Yeah. Wow. There was a question I feel like kind of goes along the lines of this. Um, which center was the most challenging one for you to decondition? You were saying you were noticing those mm. not self themes. Well, the sacral is a big one. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, that's, you know, just how much I was working, how much effort, and then just the, the constant go, go, go. And even, even today, it's like, you're, I think, I don't know if it ever really, uh, at least maybe I'm not there yet. You get to a point where you're not dealing with some level of, you know, not knowing when enough is enough as a projector. I know Amy and I are constantly trying to find that balance like, <laughs> of all the stuff that we're, we want to do. And, you know, we want to get a new podcast out and um, an article. And it's just like, that you, there's only so much time, energy and attention for anything. And so the Sacral Center, um, I can look back and see that like with this, my open spleen, uh, undefined spleen, that I probably could have stayed there for a couple years and got the benefit of the insurance and got kind of over that hump. But I think I got, you know, it's that conditioned sense of security. Like this is secure. This is what, what, this is what health is. This is what, you know, this is a good job. You should keep this job. And then six years later, I'm really sick, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, things have really mm -hmm. kind of gone too far. And so, that was another big one is just this kind of sense of like, well, I've got to go do it this homogenized way, you know, that everyone else is doing it. And by the end of that experience, I was like, never again, like I, I'll do a lot of things, but go back to that environment and, and go back to that situation. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too, that um, it really helped as, as well to uh, understand the open throat and the pressure to speak and the conditioning and, uh, and in, in that world, in, the, in that kind of corporate business world, you know, it's like you don't always really have a choice, you know, and, and you get in certain situations. But since I've started like working with Amy, you know, you guys know that she's got the head and anyone who you know, saw Amy's thing got the head Ajna throat definition. And one of the nice things about our partnership is that she can actually like hold that and be more consistent and has that kind of consistent awareness and it gives me a break. I don't have to, you know, if I want to say something or I have something to say, then, uh, then it's there. But often 
you know, I, it's kind of spontaneous. It's based on a prompt, a question. And it's been so nice to decondition that and, and, you know, to do it in a professional setting as well, which I think before I was putting a lot of pressure on my throat, um, whether it was you know, to speak or, you know, at some level of attention seeking. And I ended up getting some thyroid issues out of it. You know, my, my thyroid was kind of out of balance and kind of tanking. And, and so, and that was, a, that was another thing that I'd gone to a lot of doctors to look at, like, well, why is the thyroid like that? And, and they would all just be like, well, it could be this thing, this thing, it just kind of happened. We don't know, but here's a drug. And, and, and so human design at least gave me kind of a, a point of reference for like looking at that, like, oh, maybe I'm putting too much pressure in my throat or I'm kind of pushing too hard there. And so that's been part of my experiment as well. It's just really being quiet or not talking if I don't have anything to say and being comfortable with that. And I think having an ego helps a little bit, <laughs> I'd have to say. <laughs> I can kind of imagine what it would be like not to have an ego. Um, but I can just sit there and like stay centered in myself or, um, you know, and, and then like, all right, well, I, I guess this is, might be worth saying. So, yeah. Yeah, you can really see that in, your, in the class. Like Amy kind of leads it. And she's just kind of going through and then she'll like be like, John, do you have anything to add or what's in the going on in the in the comment box? Because you're just kind of like monitoring that and then like speaking from there. It's this really beautiful flow that you guys have with teaching. You can really see that interaction. Also, maybe you guys maybe hire some generators to do all the back end stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we know a few. <laughs> no any generators. <laughs> <laughs> that love human design and yeah. want to talk about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's been it's been a really nice compliment. That's that mm -hmm. has yeah, it's been worked out really well. And uh, and it's just interesting me, for me to observe that as it's happening. You know, it's like this whole you know kind of passenger witness consciousness is a trip. You know, you're just watching yourself doing whatever you're doing, and um, yeah. I don't know. I, I could really go off on that, but um, <laughs> you want to <laughs> just, just, the, go just you know, I, I was up at what, like 5 a.m. this morning thinking about this thing or that thing, looking at design. And um, I don't know this. I don't know how this is going to come across because, again, I feel like I'm a little bit like in a, another dimension right now. But, um, you know, this whole idea of predetermination and no choice and, you know, kind of that from the moment we're born, we have our birth chart, we've got our design. It, you don't go back and alter that time. You know, you don't, you can't, your birth chart's your birth chart. We can have an experience of everything in the wheel, mandala through, through transits, through others and all that. But from the moment we're born, we know what our imprint is. We have our imprint and we have the timing and the trajectory and the major cycles, the transits, and there, there is just, if you look at this stuff long enough and you're seeing it in people's lives, you're seeing it reflected back like in sessions and, you know, we're all looking at this together. You, you can't come away from it without feeling a little bit like, wow, this, I'm just being taken on a ride. This thing is just happening. This human design is just describing what is happening and we can watch it, we can see it or not. But then I go back to like what we were talking about earlier and like, what, was it predetermined that I was going to stay in that job for an extra six years and, and, and run myself into the ground? Like, that's kind of weird to think about. Like, you know, is even our not self, our situation, is that just, and if that's the case, well, then I don't, maybe it, maybe it really some of like the suffering or some of like the, the worry or like, Oh, is this bad? Is this okay? Is this good? It's like, well, it's just what's happening, you know? It's like, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's comfortable or you, you're enjoying or you should stay there. And, but, you know, I think a lot of it, a lot of it is just, we just kind of make it harder on ourselves through our minds and our minds interpretation of what we're doing and judging and measuring and comparing. Anyway, that's what I was tripping on at like 5 a.m. So. I've been uh, tripping on that for like two months now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like... Yeah, specifically was tripping on that this morning as well, like hardcore. So I don't know where that's coming from. But it was just this, I was having a conversation with Sammy and we were just like, we're both undefined emotionals and through the transits right now, we have that 1949 and that's a trip. But 
we were just like talking and it was just like this, whoa, whoa, <laughs> almost exactly what you were talking about. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like human design just kind of helps you accept what's <laughs> happening and what, and when I first started processing and integrating that notion of like truly no choice mm -hmm. and I still, I just don't really know open head. I don't really know, but it was like, I felt such an intense wave of forgiveness for myself and for everyone in my life that, you know, it, it's like, we think we make all of these mistakes and our mind wants to critique everything we've ever done. And, and then human design brings another layer of it because it's like, Oh, you didn't listen to your authority and look what happened now. You know, And then we like yep. beat ourselves up for that. Yep. Um, when it's a very elusive thing and it's such a learning process to even learn how to listen to your authority. So it's like, okay, well, I wasn't meant to listen to my authority. I was meant to fuck up in that way or whatever. And it, and it's it's only the mind that's even calling it a fuck up in the first place, you know? Right. Yeah. And if you kind of bring that into the present moment, like, okay, we have that awareness. We can look back and kind of see that. But now we're having this experience and we're going to be moving forward. And it, it's almost like this type of remembering or something like, you know, kind of watching, watching yourself go through the movie or just, you know, again, that kind of going on a ride and, uh, and then kind of just looking out the window and hopefully enjoying some of it along the way. So yeah. I'm trying to remind myself, you know, especially when things get in intense and we're in a pretty intense world right now. So. Yeah. Are we? Yeah. Have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes as a hermit with personal view and chores, like, <laughs> I don't notice. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I was like tripping out on the couch yesterday because I had like nothing to do all day and I couldn't get myself to do anything. My mind was like, do this, do that, do this. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not moving. I'm just laying here. And then I started having all these thoughts and I was like seeing myself going through the motions of things. Like I needed to upload our coffee talks to YouTube and I was just seeing myself doing that. And then all of a sudden I get up and I start doing it. But it didn't feel like my mind told me to do it. It just felt like my mind was almost aware that that's what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I'm like really tripping right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, I think the body provides such a, a good anchor in all of it. Like, you know, and, and we can, we're, we're obviously going to be processing a lot in the head and we take in the human design information, you know, initially through the mind. And, but it's, it's, I think we've got to find some point of contact in ourselves with our body, with the earth, with, with nature, with what is actually going on. And, and usually when I get to that place, if I go back to, to like my body's awareness in the moment or my body's experience, it's usually okay. Mm -hmm. Like the house is actually not on fire. No one's shooting at me right now. Mm. You know, it's like, it's like, it's, mm. it's like I, I am not in, 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 uh, in, you know, under threat or in the way of harm or, or whatever. Mm. And so the body is, I think, just a wonderful point of reference. And it's easy to forget that. And that's what human design kind of gives us. It's like, okay, well, you know, form consciousness and authority and, mm -hmm. and what you're saying. Yeah, it's really interesting also because we have so much coming at us all of the time now with like the information age and social media and the internet and everything that's just constantly coming at us. And um, last week, there was a few fourth lines that were like needing a retreat. And we were all like, let's shut off our screens for the day and not look at anything outside of us. And for the whole day, it really allowed me to actually connect to my body. And I started realizing how much when our attention is pulled to like screens or all mm -hmm. this information coming in outside of us, we're not paying attention to what's going on inside of us, you know? And I was like, it actually allowed me to really feel what my response feels like compared to my mind just constantly looking for stimulation, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, like... I, what I noticed on that day, because I semi partook, because I still had to take care of some business stuff on inner space screens, was just this how much things that I'm watching are like triggering my mind and my not self to like be worried about shit that I'm actually, yes. my body is not actually 
talking to me or respond, you know, I would just start to be like, ah, panic. Or, you know, if you get on TikTok and you see something, you're like, oh, why am I seeing this? The algorithm thinks I need to see this thing. It's horrible. <laughs> Is this going to happen to me? You know, and then it's like, no, I'm like chilling on my bed. <laughs> like, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> Like you go into fight or flight mode when there's nothing to actually be worried about, you know? Yeah. yeah. Right. Like a lock talking about that yesterday, just how we worry so much. We're always worrying. And especially all three of us have completely open heads. So <laughs> it's mm -hmm. constantly just coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like you're saying, if, if there's something to, to do, like, again, if, if they're, you know, if, if you step out in front of a bus, get out of the way, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a time for fear. There's fear as a type of intelligence or instinct or um, time to move. You know, this is not safe, but most of the time, I think what we're doing to ourselves is uh, yeah, just kind of, you know, mind tripping, torturing ourselves in some form. And um, I, I've gotten to the point where I usually don't put a lot of stake into it. Even like last night laying in bed, I'm just watching it and going, is there something for me to do here? If it, and usually I, I'll kind of have some sort of mantra in place. Like, well, if there, if there's something for me to act on or something for me to follow through, it will come up again or it will stay in my awareness. But all this stuff that's just passing through and I don't know quite what it is. And um, yeah, it's, it's I, I think the more that I can kind of just let it go and just watch it and not identify with it or latch onto it, it it's easier. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. John, would you like to hear my open head trip that I had last night? I would love it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what if during the transits, instead of us getting the gates, it took them away from our design? <laughs> I was like, because then I was like, because I'll never have an opportunity to know what it's not, what it's like to not have a sacral. But like, you know, it's like all of a sudden, like 34 and 27 are gone and or you know, in the it just cancels it out. Non sacral. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a trip? <laughs> I bet you there's some alternate universe where that's a thing. I don't know. Maybe it's another dimension. <laughs> so, so you're basically saying the planets are like moving around the mandala like an eraser, just taking things away. Is that <laughs> kind of the image that you're? And then when they move, you get it back. <laughs> it's like when they move back out of that. It's like oh, the sun. You get it back. Okay, here it comes again. You get it back. <laughs> You know, yeah. Um, that was a, yeah. <laughs> That'd be a trip. <laughs> it, 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 it actually relates to, uh, you know, sometimes I look out in the world and I'm like, wow, everything is just upside down. You know, it's like left is right, black is white, up is down, inside out. And, and your, 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 your vision, your, your, you know, head trip kind of reminds me of that. It's just, you know. Yeah, often things are kind of like the opposite of what we think, or mm -hmm. in, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, how do you balance um, as a projector doing all of the things that you're doing? So, like, how do you set yourself up for success in your business to not get overworked? Uh, well, the work I'm doing with Amy, we have a pretty good division of labor where we kind of, we don't overlap a whole lot. And so the, it, we end up having, yeah, a good division of work, which helps. And in, in other words, I don't think I could do any of this stuff by myself. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty obvious. Um, and then I think it's, it's about efficiency, you know, pacing and being kind of wise with, with, you know, energy, time, you know, that hopefully, a little bit of that uh, open sacral, you know, awareness can can lead to some wisdom where it's like, all right, this is this is worth doing. This isn't worth doing. Uh, being selective as well. You know, I'm a two four, and I've got twos all the way across. Uh, you know, the the personality side uh, in terms of the the personality sun, and so being selective and it's really, yeah, I would say time and energy management for me and selectivity. Yeah, you just said hopefully, and that reminded me, we talked with Amy about motivation and the importance of it as a projector. What's your experience with hope motivation? Uh, I, I tend to be a glasses half full 
you know, mm -hmm. person. Um, that's kind of my, my natural awareness or orientation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't really think about hope that much, although I can kind of see it in operation sometimes, mm -hmm. but I can certainly see when I go into transference and I go to guilt and um, that that's head tripping for me. And it's, it's like, I, I go into this kind of fix it mode and I start feeling bad about what I'm doing or the situation or something in, you know, a relationship. And then I start kind of trying to push or trying to fix or initiate something. And so when I, when I kind of see that setting up and I can catch myself, I'll just drop it. I'll just be like, okay, that's, that's probably transference. And, um, let's let's drop that and not put any more into that and then it kind of naturally will eventually kind of move back to hope is is my experience of it um but it's interesting with amy because she's guilt and mm -hmm. and we just are constantly seeing <laughs> that <laughs> dynamic play out even this morning we were talking and and uh she started laughing because i was saying something and um i can't i don't know if i can remember exactly what it was but um it was something about truth and kind of like she was describing something about like kind of running from a truth. And I was like, no, we're chasing a truth. We're chasing a truth. <laughs> She's like, Oh, you're, I'm saying we're running from a bad truth, but you're saying we're chasing a good truth. And you just see that kind of dynamic. It's like, okay, wow. We're all just filtering through our design and, um, and so, you know, I look at like motivation is kind of like another signpost. It's another point of reference for us in, in our experiment. And I think it's particularly useful for projectors. You start looking at relationships, like for me, where I um, just feel bad or I feel like I, I can't be myself or I've got it. I've got to be different than I am in these type of relationships. And then that's that's feedback. You know, that's that's a point of reference that I can have for my awareness. Mm. Yeah, I was reflecting on that yesterday and just thinking about even, even for me, how much I can see the people that are correct for me and that I actually really feel like myself around how I'm already I'm just in my motivation. And I, it's, it's not anything I even pay attention to. But when I'm with people, you know, I don't know, just like people that I end up needing to hang out with some not needing but you know we all get in those social situations sometimes where you're like mm -hmm. these aren't really my people but I'm here <laughs> and we're doing this and I'm very much just kind of like in innocence just sitting back observing not wanting to get involved with anything not wanting to take a stance and um and it's just something I watch you know I'm like oh this isn't a bad thing this is just clearly information and I don't feel like myself in this scenario you know right yeah and like we were saying earlier it's it you know i don't think any of this knowledge or this information is should be used to, to beat ourselves up or to, mm -hmm. to to punish ourselves in some yep. way or to mm -hmm. reprimand but you can go okay noted there it goes again there's that pattern or there's this dynamic that i keep saying play out and yeah you know, but, yeah. yeah i noticed that yesterday i was like spinning looping on something and then i realized I don't know what just clicked all of a sudden. I was like, I'm thinking of all the possibilities. Like I'm looking at this through possibility and I'm probability. <laughs> so it wasn't that I like was like, no, I need to be thinking what's probable. It was just like, oh, I'm spinning because I'm not even looking through the correct view, you know? Wow. It was just wild to watch that. And then as soon as I just had that awareness, I felt this peace in my body. And I was like, huh. Huh. And I didn't force myself to start thinking of what's probable, but it was just the, the awareness and the, the sense of like calm that I felt in my body once I had that awareness. Right. Yeah. That, that's why I think it's like with, we're working with like the mind side of things on the personality, whether it's like view or mm -hmm. motivation, you, you kind of can't fix the problems of the mind with the mind, you know? So if you, if you notice your mind doing something and you're like, okay, you're in transference and then your mind comes in and doubles down. Yeah. You're just going to get caught in it further versus like, Oh, okay. Stop. <laughs> yes. Okay. There. Ah. All right. Uh, yeah. There it is again. Um, so. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. Um, somebody was asking what your environment is. Is it shores? Yeah. Natural shores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, we got 
All of us are Shores. Shores. Oh yeah, Shores. <laughs> mm -hmm. I heard, I had, um, I don't know who told me this or where I read it. I don't know these days, but that if you're Shores environment, you're going to be meeting people that are in transition a mm. lot. And I was reflecting on that and I'm like, yeah, I feel like most of the friendships that I have, I met them when they were in a transition period of some sort. Most of my clients come to me in a transition, either wanting a transition or in the middle of one. Um, so yeah, have you experienced that in your life? That's interesting. I, I don't know that I've ever heard it framed quite like that, but it, it does make sense. And I mean, I think it kind of applies. I'm, I'm <laughs> because I'm especially now that I'm doing uh, so much human design. A lot of the people that come in for sessions or classes, or mm -hmm. you know, people are in some form of transition, and yeah. uh, and sometimes it's a pretty big, a big thing. I, I'll notice that I'll get a lot of people coming in around like major cycles, mm -hmm. um, you know, Saturn return, Uranus opposition, Chiron, and those are big, you know, life transitions. Um, so. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to say. It's like, again, it makes sense to me logically. Yeah. What you're saying. Totally. Yeah. Let's see what questions we got for you. I got a question for you guys. Can oh, I ask yeah. you a question? Absolutely. Uh, of course. Projector away. <laughs> <laughs> I, it just occurred to me, but two fourth lines, one conscious, one unconscious. How do you, how do you ex see that in each other and experience that in yourself? Do you, because um, I, I can talk about it from the point of view of two four, but as a four six brandy, and then Teresa, you, you're a two four as well. Um, what do you guys notice there? So I'm very much on. It feels like I'm on all the time. Um, even with my six line body, I'm still like not hermity, you know, just pulled back. But like I feel like I'm on all the time, and I'm like, hey, and talk, you know, doing this. And I definitely notice with Teresa from my perspective that it's like literally like let's take your body and go here you know like mm -hmm. let's but as far as like her fourth line from how I see it still shows up in how she like works her network and for some reason like I think I get more fourth line fatigue with that and I don't know if that's just my sixth line you know how it's all intertwined but she's more like working the network as far as it's just comes it like flows a little bit easier. It feels like, like she's not aware of it, of what she's mm. doing. And I'm like <clears throat> fourth line fatigue. Okay. I got to like chill on like responding to all these messages and talking to all these people. What do you notice Teresa? Yeah, it feels, I mean, I'm just thinking about how when you and I started talking, we just hit it off so quickly. Mm -hmm. And then when you met me in person, you were like, you're a lot more shy than I thought you'd be. <laughs> I'm like, I'm second line. <laughs> like when we like when we went to the conference and she was just like chilling and I'm like, you're so social with me. Like, wow, you're just like sitting there, you know, and I'm like wanting to talk to people and, mm -hmm. and she would kind yeah. of wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if we'd go somewhere together, like, I don't know, somewhere like a restaurant, you'd like make friends with the server, like, you know, yeah. and those are things that just take a lot longer for me. It's like if, if I and I, I don't know, I think this is a fourth line thing where if somebody's meant to be your friend, like, they're your friend right when you meet them. Mm -hmm. And maybe for me, that's where that boldness can come from is like, oh, I just feel I feel a connection with this person right away. Boldness, <laughs> you know, um, but sometimes it's like I start off really shy and then as soon as I'm comfortable, it just comes out. So mm -hmm. I would say in like in our business, I would say Brandy's the one like reaching out to guests for coffee talk mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And I'm more like waiting for people to come to me in that regard. Like there's I'm more of a pulled back type of energy and she's more of an outward mm -hmm. type of energy. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then too like when we're together and I'm like let's go do this and let's go do this and she's like I, I'm chill like like it's not like my body's not gonna move yet like <laughs> and I'm like oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep yeah it's 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 funny too even just like definitely through the profile lines it's funny and then it's also funny with um me being emotional and her not being and oh, just right. feeling how different our paces are and mm -hmm. It's such a learning experience. <laughs> it's great. 
Yeah, and the difference between having the, the second line out front and the fourth line mm -hmm. out front is a pretty big one. Oh, I, yeah. I relate to everything you're saying, Teresa. I'm like, yep. Yeah, I, and, and it's it's a body thing, that which is real, it's, that's a trip to really think about. Like, it's is it our bodies that are pulling us into these, these networking, social, you know, mm -hmm. engagements? Like, I would have an experience, um, someone would know, make an introduction or connect me with someone or something would come up and I would just be going out to coffee with them. Like, okay, we're gonna go do this. And yeah. my mind is looking at me like, why are you doing this? Like, what is, like, no, stay home. Like, leave me alone <laughs> And my body's like, there's something there, go have coffee with them, you know, or whatever. And um, it, when, I, when I finally kind of, uh, yeah, saw that in my experience and it kind of clicked, I was like, wow, that is really odd that mm -hmm. it's my body that has these social needs. And now I've been kind of able to dial into it more and see how, those connections are actually really stabilizing for the fourth line body. You know, it's like, you know, where you look at like the first line body, for example, you know, if you're like a five one, like Amy, you know, that what's stabilizing for the five one in the, in the first line body is to go inward and to go into one's own process or to go deep or you know, internalize or introspective. And so, um, yeah, profile is, you know, it's a pretty big signpost. Yeah, I noticed too, like, when I want to be like social, but then I still like, my body still like pulls back away from like, I'm like social, but then I'm like, not like really involved. And now that I'm in my second line or second part of six line process. So it's like my body. And so I've learned a lot about the sixth line, like actually like observing second lines and like seeing how they I don't know. It's weird how they how they interact. And it's like almost gives me permission to be like, oh, I don't have to be doing all these things like looking mm -hmm. at before, even though it's on the personality side, but it's still like this permission. But I do notice myself like Teresa, when we like do things like she's like in it. Like if we're like at ecstatic Sunday when she comes to Iowa and she's like moving in the movement room and then I'll do it for a little bit and then I'll I'll leave and like go socialize with people while well, her body wants to be around other bodies. And I want to just like talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's more your mind for you. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's like, Oh, my body just needs to be with these people. I yeah. mean, even like the first time I flew out to see you, my mind was like, what the fuck are we doing? We don't even like, we, we don't even know this person. What are we doing? Why are we leaving the hermit <laughs> cave? You know, <laughs> like, why are we going to the Midwest in the summertime? Like, what's happening? <laughs> Is this okay? <laughs> <laughs> and my body gets there and I'm just like, oh my God, this feels so good. You know, and it feels, yeah, it's like grounding, stabilizing. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's so interesting. That's a great question, John. Yeah. You projectors. <laughs> Stop asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to turn the table and Teresa's going to ask you a question. Yep, exactly. Well, we have a, quite a few in the question box. So I'm okay. trying to get to the people, you know, if you have the energy, John. Oh, yeah. And right. just to let you know, it didn't happen with a lock, but if it happens, if we get knocked off, we will hop back on. Yeah, if we just disappear all of a sudden, we'll come back <laughs> at okay. least to say bye. <laughs> <laughs> Um, John, this is a great question. And we talked about this in our practicum with you, but um, would you be willing to share some of your research and work in color transference, especially the fourth color? Asking for a friend, right, Jen? <laughs> oh, uh, the, the fourth the color. On the screen. What's that? Yeah, I, can you put I can see the first part of it. I mean, the, the second part's cut off, but I, oh. I, I think it just says, especially the fourth color. Okay. I mean, yeah. Um, I guess I could say a little bit about that. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the fourth color is it's said to to transfer to the other colors. It's inherently unstable. And and so, you know, when you're looking at like determination, for example, and you have fourth color, which would be what uh, calm or nervous, I believe, then what I've noticed and kind of seen is that there isn't that same kind of well, it's interesting, too, because I'm talking about determination transference, which is actually what I'm writing my my thesis on for the for the DDP, mm -hmm. which is probably why I went there. But um, yeah, it's, there, there we're, I'm noticing like on the body side that there there does seem to be a definite pattern of color transference 
where you'll go to um, the, you know, the, the upper harmonic or the lower harmonic of, of that color. So the four to the one or the one to the four. And that seems to be kind of a conditioned way of eating where it's almost like if, if you're being compromised, or you're not with the right people or in the right environment, it's almost, it seems like a little bit like a coping mechanism or something where we'll start kind of, um, you know, for me, and we've talked about this before, I just realized we've covered some of this in other conversations. Um, and I've talked to, to Phil a bit about this, who's I think I saw on, on the uh, live, but, you know, for me, I'm closed. So second color and transfers over to the fifth, which would be sound based. And I used to, just to listen to so much music um, earlier in my life. I was actually in the music business before I was in software and that I still love music. I still have a relationship with it, but it doesn't, it's not as, um, it doesn't drive me. It's not so much of a big thing in my life or a pull um, music. And I, and I think that as we kind of start aligning, just to kind of wrap up this, this thread, but we start aligning with our form more, we'll see that kind of come back into its natural, you know, determination and its, its, its natural you know, design. Um, with the fourth color, I don't know how much more I can say about it, except it does, doesn't seem to follow that normal pattern. Um, I, I've seen it kind of jump around a little bit. Sometimes it does transfer um, to, to you know, the opposite of the harmonic, and sometimes it seems like it goes through another process. So. Yes. Yeah, it's almost like music was feeding you at one point until you didn't need it to feed you. Right. Like a, yeah, like a coping mechanism. And yeah. then when I started kind of change, you know, changing the, the environment changed, I started kind of living differently, um, taking better care of myself. It just kind of started fading away. Like the body seems like it wants to come back to, to its natural state or its healthy state. Mm -hmm. If you, if we give it a chance. Mm -hmm. yeah. All okay. right. Can you dive into ego authority and how that works for you? I've had several ego authorities confused about the difference between ego and emotional. Mm. Hmm. Well, they're, they're very different. Yeah, ego's weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird authority. It took me a while to kind of get a, get a handle on it. And uh, it's funny, it, it just kind of pops in my mind. But I remember like, early on, um, I did a handful of sessions with... Um, with John Martin down in Hawaii. And we did a couple of one-on-one -on -one sessions. And one of the first things he said to me, he's got this great way of, um, of just kind of interrupting the mind and just kind of like punching you in, in a way that kind of interrupts this, this head stuff that's going on. And, um, and so at one point, you know, we're, we're talking and he's like, you know, you're just a dumb ego flying through space. Right. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, wow, that's really, something to say to a client you know like <laughs> but you're not wrong you're actually you're not, not wrong. wrong you're not wrong it's like that i i just i saw the truth and i'm like yeah it kind of is like that where you know if you look at the ego as an as an authority it's a motor it's not an awareness center right and um it kind of depends i think on where that you know, where the ego is defined is it defined to the g like for me or is it defined to the spleen or to the emotional system or to the throat it's going to operate a little bit differently based on that but it's a motor and there's for me there's an energetic kind of push in a direction and for me it feels like i have to i can't not mm -hmm. and this is where it kind of gets into my other part of my you know channel definition into the g with the 2551 um, channel of initiation, it's, it's kind of a pull, like a magnetic pull towards like a, a direction, but the direction is actually to who I am, to my identity. This is kind of who I am and what I, what I have to do and I can't not do it is, is one way of kind of describing it. And, and hopefully it's in kind of my, you know, in service of my highest self, um, you know, if, if, if it's in alignment, but, when it moves, I feel like I'm getting taken on a ride, like kind of like John was saying, or I'm, I don't, I don't actually have choice in that, which is the funny thing. I don't get to choose what my, what my ego um, has the will for or not. It has the will for it or it doesn't in the same way that I would say like, you know, a, 
a sacral generator or any generator doesn't choose what they have the energy for. That's the mind coming in saying, you know, oh, you should have the energy for this and do this. And so my experience of authority is actually no choice. It's like, wow, that's interesting. So what do you do? You just kind of, you get pulled along into the thing that you have to do. And if it's not, um, it's not like it's always on, you know, the, I think the ego is off a lot of the time. But when it counts, then there's this kind of internal point of reference that I have that's just like, I have to do this. I can't not do this. This is who I am. So wow. I don't know, Osha, if that, if that answers your question, but um, that's my experience of it. And I imagine it'd be a little bit different, you know, for a different channel definition to the ego. Yeah, now I'm like, wow, what is it like for a manifester that only has the money line or mm -hmm. like, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, let's see. Have you had any experience with or looked into how designs that have a certain line that it lacks operates? For example, my design lacks second lines. Yeah, I have. I have experienced in my own chart where I have no six lines. So I'm not a role model. Everyone take note. Don't do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> ask Amy, ask anyone who knows me, don't go down the crazy roads that I'm going down. I That's feel not, like, I don't feel like do like it. Jen, Jen needs to make a hat that says not a role model for people without six lines. <laughs> um, but uh, I have no six lines except in my design nodes. So six color, six mm -hmm. line. And what I, I don't identify with being a six line at all. I, I just they don't look. Mm -mm, no, that's not <laughs> what we're doing here. And uh, and so there's that. And then I noticed that I end up probably because of the nodal six line. I end up pulling in. I have a, I'm surrounded by a lot of six lines as well. They're just they're I have important six line relationships in my life. And that's something I, I think you could probably file under, you know, we're kind of attracted to what we're not or we don't have, or, but it also could be that nodal thing. Um, so yeah, I just don't really, I don't get it. I don't identify, I can see it. I can describe it academically, academically. We can talk about the six line process, but yeah, I don't relate to it very much. Interesting. I'd also wonder like on the other end of that, people who have like a ton of, let's say they're a five one, but they have a ton of fourth lines in their design. It's like, mm -hmm. would they almost act like a fourth line more often or would we feel them as more like a fourth line? I have, I have a, a really good astrologer friend um, and I believe she's at six three and she is one of the most heretical people I know. And when I first got her chart, I was like, she's got to, you know, got to be, um, you know, got to be a fifth line, got to have a fifth line profile. And then I look at my six, three, where, what, what is this? And then I go and I start counting up the lines and she's got like something like 11 fifth lines in there. And, and so I, I think that you can see that a lot where um, you, you get this predominance of lines in the activations and you're going to see that theme play out. People, your people will pick up on you or that's just going to be part of how you operate. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if they have like, the gate of behavior, like gate 10 in one of those lines, you know, because that's how you're going to witness their behavior because mm -hmm. I have 10.6. I don't have a lot of six lines in my chart, but I have 10.6 and people are always telling me like, you're such a role model for me. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, but it's, I think it might be, I don't know if it's unconscious. I can't remember, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's quite entertaining sitting here, listening to two second lines be like, I don't know. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> I was I was tripping on that this morning. I was trip, tripping on the second line in my in, and like how we don't really know what we do. And there's almost that's where the shyness comes from. And there's almost like kind of a um, a type of insecurity in the second line that you would kind of associate with the first line. It's like there there's still some first line in the second line, or I don't know how that works. Mm -hmm. But but there there's like that because we don't really can't really see ourselves. We don't really know how we do what we do. It ends up 
thing like uh don't put us under pressure don't make us perform don't because we don't even know what we're doing here and um, <laughs> but then if we're in our natural habitat or natural environment and we can relax and be ourselves then it mm -hmm. you know it just expresses in its in its own unique way and there's something special about it there's something that really interesting or unique about the second line mm -hmm. um, but i think if you start putting it under pressure or you're kind of pushing it out there if it doesn't feel like it can be itself and be natural it's you know you're gonna it's going to get weird and probably be some level of insecurity in there. Oh yeah. Like if it's not the right call, you know? Um, and I think that's, what's trippy about it for me as, a, as an MG, because I still need to be called out. And so there's almost this feeling of like waiting for invitations a little bit, you know, it's kind of like waiting to be recognized <laughs> and called out. Um, and I've had, I've had moments like that where I have, answered the wrong call and then it's mm -hmm. totally stressed me out and pressured me like you know I play guitar and I sing and I I used to do it all the time on my Instagram I just put up videos and da 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 and I remember I had somebody reach out and be like will you come play at my restaurant you're amazing you know and I was like okay because this was years ago and I didn't know anything about design at the time and um I like I didn't have a set list you know, they were just assuming, projecting onto me that I could do a three hour set. <laughs> right. And I open egoed myself and proved that I could, you know, and like spent hours and hours and hours trying to get this set list down. And then it was, I wouldn't say I was terrible, <laughs> but it was kind of a disaster. <laughs> it was just mm -hmm. like, I was not prepared. I just, it was so much pressure. And then I'm like trying to live up to this expectation because they think I'm so amazing. But really, I'm like, kind of just half ass learning songs and then playing a clip on my Instagram, you know, they're not really seeing what's happening. Um, so anyways, that's my second line pressure story. And after that, I was like, it was like, I kind of knew what my authority was like without actually knowing what that was, because um, the whole situation made me so nervous. And as an emotional, it's like, I said yes to something when I was super nervous about it. Um, so anyways, that's my second line tangent. Second lines, don't say yes to things that make you feel like you cannot deliver. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and it's, I think you're making a good point too. The other side of like the projection field from the fifth line is, you know, the mm -hmm. second line has a version of that. And mm -hmm. yeah, you push, a, you, you push a second line out into an uncomfortable situation that they don't feel, um, you know, that doesn't feel correct to them or natural to them. And that can be really weird, really, really rough. I think I've been in a few of those and they were based on projections coming in from adults when I was growing up or parents and like, mm -hmm. Oh, you should do this. And you push it out there. And next thing you know, you're like, Oh man, what am I doing here? This is, it's insane. Um, <laughs> and so I, I like to think about like the, you know, the second line, it needs to have that barrier. It needs to be that selectivity. And um, I actually think in your in your case, Teresa, it kind of works to your favor because um, it kind of will slow things down, you know, with the emotional definition. And it's like you can really take your time with it. you got that barrier. And then the metaphor I like to use for the second line, or at least my two four profile, is that the the door is not locked. It's just heavy and you might have to pull on it a few times. It's like, you know, you, you have to make some effort to, to get in. Um, you know, two fours are usually nice and friendly, but I think if it's really correct, the person will, you know, come at us a couple times or like, we're going to really be able to, to feel that that frequency is, it tastes good to us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that we want, we want to interact with. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, I'll be like, oh, why does this person keep talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just my second line, like, leave me alone. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I really like this person. Oh, my gosh, now we're having a really cool conversation. Okay, now we're connecting. And it's like, they're getting through to me. They're getting through the door. I love that analogy. Yeah. So good. Well, how we feeling, gang? <laughs> John, you need some sleep? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Like just looking out for the projector here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm I'm good for a little bit longer. If there's any other questions, um, okay. I think I've I've got class in about four, you know, coming up in a little bit. So yeah, we'll just do a, a few. Uh, okay, he has a break between, so he's not a super generator. Right, yeah, we don't See, want that every day. Um, these are just some. I think this is just kind of following up on your com or your story about your health and i don't know if you already answered this i can't remember where we went in our tangents but 
um, has your health adjusted? Like, do you, have you noticed your health is much better now that you're operating more like a projector? Yes. I, I know, I noticed that it, there's a couple interesting things there. Like I, when I was kind of going through this healing deconditioning recovery process health wise, a lot of stuff just kind of uh, cleared up automatically where I was having digestive issues or, um, you know, sleep issues or there's just what various things that were going on although i had sleep issues last night but um there used to be a lot more it was kind of chronic and there was this kind of gradual process of that stuff just kind of going away and, and you know starting to kind of get in touch with how much energy i actually had i think that the uh, the what i was doing before is i was looking for ways to get more energy like okay i these these supplements these herbs this caffeine will basically boost my energy and then what i kind of saw along the way is if you want more energy stop wasting energy stop doing so much <laughs> right you, you have the energy that you have your body is designed a certain way it is what it is you know you're going to have variations and fluctuations in it but that was a big part of it is just to start becoming more wise with with my energy and taking care of my body and listening to it and then the other thing i was going to say is i noticed that when I got out of those situations and I made those corrections, I think I used this metaphor the other day, maybe it was in class or something like, it's like going on an elimination diet. You start taking things away. You know, you think you have a food allergy and like, well, let's identify what food that is. Maybe it's gluten, maybe it's dairy, maybe it's this. And you start taking these things away and then you get back to, you know, to, to ground zero, wherever you are with that. And you can start introducing them one by one and then getting a more clear read on, on, Hey, does this agree with me? Does this, does this agree with my body? Does this, this frequency agree with me? And I noticed that it, be, it gets louder and harder to kind of uh, tolerate things that I used to tolerate in the past that, that I used to be able to just to kind of go do now the feedback is quicker. And if I eat something that's not on my closed diet, I'll know within 24 hours. I'll, I'll probably know within six hours. It's like, okay, that did not sit well. And um, also people in situations, you know, I go into certain situations. I'm like, wow, I, I cannot be myself here. You know, this is so obvious and loud here. It feels so uncomfortable mm -hmm. and I've got to perform or I've got to be something else. And it just becomes harder to tolerate. I think once, once you kind of do that work, and, and you've healed from it because you know what it was like before. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like de and, deconditioning is like the elimination diet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it really goes to show why projectors are known to have, or why projectors have the potential to be so efficient with energy and to be able to see that for generators, oh, you're not being efficient with your energy. Like, let's guide you to this. You know, I can really mm -hmm. hear that shine through in you speaking there. Yeah, it's almost like we have to kind of learn for ourselves the hard way sometimes. Um, you know, it's like, I, I think that, you know, there's all that talk about like projector guidance, you know, and, and what are we guiding from? I think we're, we're guiding from our, really our, our experience with conditioning, uh, our, you know, the experience that we have through our open centers, if we're, with, we've done a certain amount of work there, we always have internally, we have our, you know, our strategy and authority for ourselves. Um, but if you've, you know, seen, if you've, if you've lived through, you know, deep exhaustion and burnout and health issues, then you have a kind of a very real point of reference for, um, you know, for what, where that goes. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's interesting. And it's, it's also interesting when you see generators come in exhausted, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I, I do get a handful of generator clients coming through. And they are so tired. And to me, it's just saying that they're using their energy doing something they don't really want to do. It's not for them. It's not satisfying. They're dragging themselves through it for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think what the body will do, the sacral center will just shut off. It's just mm -hmm. going to say, no, done. Or in my case, with my with my throat, my thyroid, it's like, okay, we'll down regulate. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, let's bring the metabolism down, slow down, stop doing it. But we're kind of, you know, we're kind of thick sometimes, you know, we, you know, I know I am with my ego. It's like, I'll, I'll have to go bang my head against the wall and then eventually get to a point where I, okay, I'm done with that, I guess. Let's, I give up, you know, and, you know, what else? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, it, it's interesting because Brandy and I primarily work with generators and they come in with this almost misconception around the sacral that like, but I am supposed to have all this energy to do all the things. And I'm like, no, that's your conditioning that wants you to do all the things. Just be, right. it's just like you, just because you have consistent willpower doesn't mean you get to choose what it's used for. Mm -hmm. And our sacrals are actually fixed. So yeah, we have exactly. sustainable energy when whatever it is is correct for us. And I think that can be a hard pill to swallow for a lot of generators. And then, just realizing like, like Martin Grassinger says, it's a, a tab that you got to pay with the body eventually, like the more exactly. you override it, it's, mm -hmm. it's just going to come back around. And it also just makes me think like kind of bringing this full circle to what we were talking about earlier with when you, you were saying, well, if there's really no choice, I had no choice to like burn myself out and learn the hard way. And that's, I mean, every projector I've talked to has gone to that point of like super extreme, super generator. And now they have all this wisdom around energy. And when they work with a generator, they're like, wait a minute, <laughs> your energy is precious. Like it's fixed. Let's show you how it actually um, works for you and, you know, have it work with you instead of against you. Yeah. I love that point you're making just that the specificity of definition. Like mm -hmm. if you, if you have a defined sacral center, it's going to be defined in a handful of ways, maybe one way. And the more you know, the more specific it is, that means that you're only going to have that type of response to certain things, certain uh, experiences, certain people, certain questions. And um, I think a lot of what that kind of leads to is that for all of us, there's a lot less for us to do than we think we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And so we can relax. <laughs> Snaps for John on that Just one. Just <laughs> chill, hopefully. Uh, one of my favorite words is tranquilo, you know, just mm -hmm. easy, like, let's take it easy. Mm -hmm. um, until you, you know, until there's a reason otherwise, sometimes there's life calls for something else. Yeah, especially yeah. With those, those generators that just have like root to sacral. <laughs> and then, you know, like that's their or like one channel there. And it's like, they're doing so much or think they need to be doing so much. I'm like, Oh, you work on a pulse, man. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, enjoy. Yeah. Enjoy when you're not pulsing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're like, for me, I only have the 659. That's what makes me a generator. Um, and I notice I'm like, if I'm in the mood, I'm always a yes to like bonding and emotional connection and intimacy. And, but when it comes to just like laboring myself, I can't do it anymore. You know, yeah. it's, I did that for 15 years in the hospitality industry. And the old, probably the only reason I kept in it for so long was because of the camaraderie that would develop with my crew and like, being a fourth line, you know, but it's once you realize how fixed your nature really is in that way, where it's like, that's not what, that's not how I want to work, you know? Right. Yeah. Love it. Oh, well, this feels like a great place to wrap up. John, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. And for those that are curious about working with John, um, is your, we'll put all your stuff in the, in the show notes or the bio or the whatever. <laughs> like, I don't know what platform we're on. We're on all the platforms lately. So, um, and then if people want to take classes with you and Amy, they are who, Brandy and I went through, we highly, highly recommend this is a human design collective Stan account. <laughs> I feel like we don't shut up about you guys. <laughs> like we mentioned you in every single episode. Every <laughs> single episode. Thank you. So yeah, if you're wanting to take the foundation classes, they're who we absolutely recommend. And um, yeah, did, is there anything else? One, I'm reading with John, like obviously, I mean, if you're looking for PHS stuff, I know there's, that's like a little bit, like you want to be like living your design a little bit before, I mean, or whatever's correct, whatever's right with you, whatever your authority says, but um, John would be a reliable source to go to for PHS information. Yep. Happy to do it. Um, love working with people one-on-one. -on -one. It's kind of my sweet spot. So, um, and yeah, it's, yeah. I have a, so I've got a website, metamorphichumandesign.com, and then Human Design Collective mm -hmm. is for the classes and workshops. So yeah, that's, that's where you can find me. 
tagline i like working with people one-on-one -on -one. tell me your projector without telling me <laughs> right it's 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 so nice just to drop in and look at the map together with someone and i always kind of i feel like i'm like a kind of like a i don't know an interpreter or something you know i'm just reading this map but i'm also kind of tuning in as a projector like who are you what's going on with you what's your experience and there's this really nice kind of dynamic and feedback you know that kind of loop that happens where um yeah i felt like i learned so much and i love hearing you know clients basically keynote their own chart unknowingly they'll start, they'll start telling and using language and and i'm like oh this is so cool and i like to point it out when i can i was like wow you're you know you're getting this you know you can see it um, i so, love that too yeah. it's so fun so fun anyway awesome. thanks this has been fun um thanks, for thanks us. again We'll talk All to right. you soon, I'm sure. Bye, John. Yes. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.